soberness of our messages that today have reminded, I guess, people that while I'm a joyful Christian, I'm also very sober-minded and serious at times that <laughs> I am aware of who I am in the Lord and I'm saved by grace. And the reason why I'm especially aware of that is because of the sinful nature that I have not because of the grace that I've been given, because that would be easy to conceive of. But when you fail, then you appreciate grace. If you've never failed, <laughs> you're just talking a story about grace, because you don't really know what it is. Not until you fall flat on your face. And so, in devotions and emotions, we sometimes are comforted, sometimes strengthened, sometimes confronted, sometimes convicted, sometimes conformed, sometimes created into a new creation. But all those things are what God does as he speaks to us and reminds us that we are his and he would have words for us to hear from him today. Christian responsibility is a day-by-day -day reality. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. When we believe that Christ died for the unjust, making it possible for the unjust to live with the just in complete moral congruity, do we mean that redeemed and forgiven men and women have no further responsibility to God for their conduct? Because of where they live and how they live and what they live and how they do and what they do and everywhere that they go, they know that everybody is going to do. <laughs> Does this mean that now they are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, that they will never be called to account for their deeds? Do you think they're going to get away with it? God forbid. How could the moral governor of the universe release a segment of that universe from the moral law of deeds and consequences and hope to uphold the order of the world? Within the household of God, among the redeemed and justified, there is law as well as grace. Not the law of Moses that knew no mercy, but the kindly law of the Father's heart that requires and expects of his children's lives lived in conformity to the commandments of God. Jesus exemplified those in the Sermon on the Mount. Read them. They are direct. The Lord told us plainly, as have the apostles, that we must all give an account of the deeds done in the body. And he has warned us faithfully of the danger that we shall have for a reward only wood, hay, and stubble in the day of Christ. Romans 14, 7 and 12, and 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. The judgment unto death and hell lies behind the Christian, but the judgment seat of Christ lies ahead. There that question will not be the law of Moses, but how we have lived within the Father's household. We have the Bible before us and the Holy Spirit within us. Tozer would say, I believe we have we may anticipate and prepare ourselves for the judgment seat of Christ by honest self judgment in this life. You know, Jesus made it pretty simple. I mean, I don't know why sometimes doctrines get written or things get complicated or people talk about all these other aspects of what they need to do or don't do because he said you know judge not so don't judge he said if you do judge this is what you're going to get if you merciful you'll get mercy if you judgmental you'll get judgmental so he said don't judge pretty simple to me but then he said also in other place likewise in the same message let a man judge himself, and he would not be judged. Oh, okay, so really, if we take stock of ourselves, recognizing that we're sinful, and knowing that we need to be forgiven, would that not cause you to come to the Father and ask for forgiveness? Then we are. So we need to be aware when we sit down with our Bible, or when we sit down in the morning to talk to God, or in the evening when we relate to Him, or as we share with him our day and make him personal and real in our lives, that what God says, he means. He's not just sitting here to entertain us. And his word wasn't written for a theological idea or some doctrinal you know, thesis that 
we can look at the history of the ages of man and make some determination from it. But he wrote it speaking to us direct. When you read it, he's speaking to you absolutely. There is no confusion in any of what he wrote. It is all laid out for you to understand. Just read it. It's that simple. Take it for what it means and means what it says because the Holy Spirit will apply it to your life. Because once you've read it, it may seem strange because it's going to sound a funny way to make it a reality for you, but once you've read it, you're accountable for it. So if it says there was something you should do, I hate to tell you this, but you better do it. <laughs> because you will have no excuse. And that's what Romans says. The natural man is without excuse because he had the knowledge of God within him. Likewise, the spiritual man is without excuse because we have a Lord and God we can speak to every day. No one in this life can blame the pastor, the teacher, the elder, the deacon, the neighbor, the friend, the relative, or any other being, living, dead, or alive, or not, for what you do with your personal relationship with God. You can't blame anyone else. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. But you can rejoice in knowing God and having Him daily fill you with His light and His love and His mercy and the grace to go forward each day excited by what's going to happen. You don't have to be bummed out. You don't have to be confused. You just really need to sit down, have a cup of coffee with God, and read, talk, listen, hear what He has to say. God loves you. He didn't save you so that you could be <laughs> tied up in knots. He saved you so that you could learn of Him and know Him. And in knowing Him, find that God is... God always has been. God never changed, but He is this. God is love. And you'll never know until you know Him personally. But when you do, wowzer. <laughs> God is love.